colleagues, um, we're at a, a really interesting point in history and the school and in the university and in the city. And what I'd like to do is kind of a group conversation. We'll see how it works and we'll adjust as we go. But the where to from here question is very much on our mind as we sense a kind of there's a victory lap around the building, but after all, it's a platform from which we should catapult rather than sink into and relax. And so if, if indeed, as Bradshaw suggests, there's more to do, there is the question of priority and the, the um, enormity of range of possibilities that we, we are so privileged as an academic institution to be able to chart our own course within certain constraints and limitations. The faculty is only so big, there's only so many issues we can take on. So having an opportunity to, as we have, kind of look back, shake hands and be happy about what has been accomplished, where we are right now, and then looking forward is the opportunity to, to kind of engage. What I'm going to ask you all to do, this is a, a warning order. Um, and that's a combat term, by the way. We issued a warning order just before combat. But the warning order is, here it comes, be thinking about it, which is, um, it, I bet each of you has some sense of priority of what would be the most important uh, next thing that would help the school get to another level of um, capacity of uh, impact, of uh, ways of shaping the way we think about architecture and planning in the future. The Petrucca was a, a thread of sort of the social construction of this place in western New York and broader, but it, it clearly had a strong kind of um, uh, ethic of, of engaged social um, um, movement, yeah, to put a simple phrase to it. There's so many other things going on in the school that didn't get captured in that. And even what we captured was fairly fairly modest. So we shouldn't let it drive the answer to a question, where to from here. But it would be start a start. To set this up, I want to offer a kind of framework that I've been using lately from, from a, a book called Active Hope. Um, and the, the narrative on that is pretty straightforward. But it starts from a sense of gratitude and um, maybe even um, uh, excitement about what's already been accomplished, what we, what we can experience today. Um, uh, that is, all that's good. Adding something to the pool doesn't necessarily take away from that. So it might be a question about what else. There's also a kind of um, pattern that fits with it, which is really grief. Um, Omar yesterday suggested one of the things on the horizon might be climate change as a, a pedagogical tool, as a way of understanding where we feel pressure now and what we frankly grieve over because of the way in which we have chosen to live our life on this planet in a manner that actually threatens uh, a, a number of, of kind of possibilities with regard to living life well. So if you situate the grief wherever you might feel it to be, the need is another way of saying it, but grief gives you a broader range of considerations in what you're grateful for. There's a kind of obvious question about what, where, where to from here, what next, what are we going to do now? And um, hanging on to the idea that this building doesn't mean we're done, it means we're just getting started. What's the next most important sort of focus area or thrust that you would like the faculty uh, uh, to consider as they start framing the next five years of, of how we move forward as a school of architecture and planning? So what I'd like you to do is actually take a few minutes in silence, think about that, and give it a note on the yellow stickies. We'll then do a kind of out loud brainstorming um, I will ask you, those of you who have a lot of confidence in what you have written, to tell us what it is. Bradshaw will bring it up to the board. And bringing it up to the board, we'll start to see if there's a way of ordering or organizing them to see if there's patterns in the response that you're offering. 
And it's just, again, it's a way of opening the conversation about, you know, there's a lot of people with a lot of really good ideas in this room who've lived life a long, intermediate, and relatively short times compared to some of us old parts. And so the question <laughs> is, what, what do you got? So take a minute in silence and think about it and give us the phrase that would provoke some conversation about an imperative or a priority that we should work on. Sorry to give you homework on a Saturday morning at 10.40. <laughs> find yourself into the second paragraph, stop. <laughs> <laughs> so let me see hands of first graduating class. Anybody here? One, two, three. Let's start with you guys. Yeah. You're old enough to take the heat. Oh, he's still asleep. He's still asleep. He's, he's, not, he's not asleep. He's not asleep. Well, I just, I just put some, some catchphrases here on what I thought. You, you made a list. Out. You didn't give me a high priority. Well, <laughs> it, it, it is somewhat in there, but I've been on academics for so long. Um, I was just looking at things that I think weren't talked about enough and, and some of the things, uh, things like climate change. I didn't hear anything about resiliency at all, and resiliency at least is becoming a bigger and bigger issue right now. So if you're not looking at resiliency, then you're not looking at, at much of that. The idea of looking beyond social, cultural, and economic policies, which I didn't hear much of, and maybe it's because I'm just not involved with the school as much as I should be. Um, the actual taking of the research that you've done and making it real. I, I heard a couple projects this morning. The question was, was any of it built? Has any of it moved forward? So I think that when you start to get product out there, it's also important for the school. And it's good to have people that are involved in that on a regular basis. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> you yeah, give it right off. You should feel free to continue. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. These are more observations, and one is the automobile. Um, maybe it's not so noticeable here in Buffalo and Western New York because you're within a 20-minute commute for the most part. But if you travel at most other places, you'll find that gridlock is just a significant issue. It's big-time issue. And what my point was, to adjust some social thinking toward reducing gridlock. That's one. Oh, he got another one, but hold it, hold that one. He, he snuck it into two, I'll come back for you. All right, and down here, our third early graduate. It seems like uh, Roly and I came from the same roots. We came from building science, and we came with the same idea. Um, so. Um, my perspective would be the same as uh, from a resilience uh, design perspective. Uh, we're looking forward. The issues of climate change, community, um, and a vision and strategies that relate at the building level, at the regional level, and obviously um, globally, it's going to be different because of the impacts of change. But to refocus the design strategies around resilience. Excellent. So, folks, um, would you pull the top one off for me, just in case you want to write another one while we get into this? Video? <laughs> so, at some level, um, if we just take these three and going back to those early origins, origins, um, uh, an observation I want to make about the automobile is worth it. Uh, about five months ago, I was in Detroit with uh, eight colleagues from the university where we sat down with Bill Ford uh, at the Luge plant. Now, you got an image sitting here in a plant that makes cars, right, and makes trucks. And you look for acres and acres and acres at what they think is a green campus, right? You know, grass on the roofs, 
stop hiding other things. We listened to him for a full day present things from his futurists, things from his plant managers and engineers, things from his marketing team and so forth. And we heard this manufacturer who builds cars for a living and trucks for a living say, we can't do that anymore. What are you going to do, Bill? I don't know. <laughs> but, and then he starts to describe the driverless car, the the fact that that's not going to solve the problem because if you go to gridlock, it's still cars on the street. Maybe fewer, maybe easier parking, maybe lots of things, but ultimately, given the way we are urbanizing, it's a failed strategy. So here he is with one business plan, which is make more faster and make more money on each one, and says, that plan is broken. I need a new business plan. And we talked about how that, metaphorically, is like so many other things going on in our world. So he's bringing his team to Buffalo this fall and um, going to spend some time with us because he really liked the way we had described how this community is organizing around the idea of resilience going to the other side because both of those are part of the same formula that if you stop putting carbon in the air, if you start looking at electric cars, if you start looking at those as transition strategies to something else, how does a car, a, a car manufacturing business strategy become a kind of urban development strategy? And how does a car manufacturing company become something that he's starting to call more and more, and you see it in their ads, a mobility company? And is it really more about getting the stuff to folks or getting folks to the stuff? Or what's the balance and what's the stuff? So all really good starts. Now you you got a comment, I gotta come around or maybe get the mic to it, and that would do it. I was not addressing strictly the transportation, but also the social issues of we have people in one spot that drives to here and then the people in this spot that are driving there because of the, the work environment. There may be social ways that we can reduce the need for transportation. Got it. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. We just recently concluded a mobile safety net study uh, over several years in 12 communities that describes the ability for our communities to get to the services or have services brought to them related to the mobile safety net. And what you find out is that, of course, transportation is the biggest issue because of where the service outlets are located. And many of the most in need of those services can't get to them. So now what are you going to do? So that's a piece of that larger question. I want to go to anybody who graduated in the 70s. Raise your hands for me. I'm going to come around and pick up your sheets. You got to tell me about it? Tell me, oh, good for you. I like this. You like talk, this? Talk, talk, talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> having spent most of my life living in Big Bad New York City, I now live in Northwest Montana. And I am seeing um, a resurgence of small farms. Uh, organic and otherwise on small lots, on personal property. I just went to a friend's home who's on a quarter of an acre and he's building a big uh, hydroponics greenhouse and it was just, he filled every single sandbag himself. And I, I think this is a great thing for urban cities um, as long as the cities let you do it. But um, not just for the food, but for the ability to learn to, to know where, people don't know where the food comes from. <laughs> And the aquaponics and hydroponics and geothermal heat and all that is a wonderful thing for the future. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, mostly transportation access that you recommended before. I see a lot of it in the east side. Um, children being killed on the streets because there's no sidewalks. Moms walking with their babies and strollers and being hit by cars. Um, and then um, just easy access to stores and uh, health facilities. I, I should have done this first. Tell us your name. Helene Robinson. Mm -hmm. Mary Rowe. Thank you very much. Do we have anybody else from the 70s? Right. There she is. Uh, hi. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. And yesterday. This is bad. 
I think, a very important se series of sessions. And one of the things I would like to see happen, I think more global uh, continuity and connectivity with um, and education of poverty-stricken countries like places in Africa and South America, and one way to do it is to teach the, na the natives, the people there, various work ethics and abilities and also create schools and libraries for children to learn the future forward so they have a good future. And for those of you who don't know, that's Bonnie Albert. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. So it, it's not great facilitation technique, but let me offer some commentary on what we've just heard, because it's really good. You may know we have the American Planning Association's Food Lab. We're doing a series of, of, of large pieces of work on food systems policy at a municipal level. You know, you have, a, you have a, this sort of notion of a, a, a water-based ecology. You've got a, a whole host of other things to pay attention to. You have the people in charge of water, you have the people in charge of sewer, but nobody at a municipal level is in charge of food policy. So understanding where food comes from, farm to table, understanding urban farming as a potential, all of that seems to be on our radar screen. They're doing a couple million dollars of, of, of research work on both health effects of environment and settlement patterns and more specifically than food access and food system security. Um, it, it's a kind of uh, an interesting twist on all of that. I, I also, what, what was the other piece we had there? The, uh, on, the, on the global work, um, we have a new center that I, I introduced yesterday and global health equities. Again, this notion that there might be a new metric in addition to the ones we now employ on the performance we expect from the environment and health is one of them. We're looking at some of the extreme cases. They've been to Uganda looking at resettlement with the Danish Resettlement Agency. There are a variety of other places. Some of our faculty have worked in a variety of places around the world. I think sooner or later the refugee thing is going to be where did they come from, what's it like getting here, and then what's it like actually putting down roots and being here, and how does all of that as a system work, and Erkin is, is starting to do that. This is not to say that's not a high priority, therefore, that we're already doing it, but what the conversation does is allow us to think about whether that's something that we give even more focus to or whether there's new things on the horizon with regard to that. We're also working on access to transportation. We, if we don't get you on tape, it never happened. We're also working on um, access to, te to transportation and understanding street, uh, street safety and security. Um, plus, we have partners who are working on uh, robotic vehicles. Exactly. So you, you begin to get a sense of how that then tracks in with some of the other conversations we've had. Um, so let's go to the class of the 80s. Who we got here graduated in the 80s? Um, coming over here. All right. Got a, got a microphone over there. Um, and then stay, stay to pick up the sticky, Corey. So um, I put down um, continue projects that address reality and social justice. Um, I'm thinking physical forms that challenge road social order. And I'm thinking also addressing issues, that some of which have already been mentioned, like climate change, affordable housing. Excellent. Thank you very much. Who else from the 80s? <laughs> Give me a hand. There's one here, Chris, and back here. Um, <coughs> No, here. Okay, go. Um, I, you know, one of the one of the things that this school has done well is, is community engagement, and um, it, it, you know what I've heard here makes me continues to make me proud to, to have be a product of, of, of this program. Um, I would say uh, continue and enhance the community engagement in Western New York and and a. A more concrete piece of that um, could be from from a, a uh, graduate of a different program at UB um, would would be uh, that includes collaboration with other professional disciplines uh, to improve the quality of of life in Western New York. 
Terrific, thank you. Um, again, uh, just a note of where we are and where we need to go. It's affirming where we are. There are new programs in collaboration across the campus. I think you may have heard me speak of some of this um, uh, yesterday or today. But that those programs that deal with community health equity are cross-disciplinary programs. There's 11 deans in the mix on that study. Investigations going to climate change and other such things are tied to our Renew Institute Energy, Water, and Environment. That's also funded at a pretty high level to work across as an area of focus. These are new initiatives in the school, so it's not like they're done. <laughs> it's like they're literally just beginning. And again, I'll go back to the bandwidth with regard to, okay, you're reinforcing, go for it, in that mix and on the subject of engagement related to it. But um, it, it doesn't give us a, a, a new trajectory, but reinforces one that we've already planted some seeds and are starting to see a little growth in. Thank you. Others from the 70s, or 80s, excuse me. I think I there. There we go, Chris. I'm Christine Fromgen Carrera. <clears throat> okay, I had a couple ideas. Try to be. How many pages do you have? <laughs> <laughs> it's one sentence. Okay. <laughs> okay. My ideas were about how to use architecture, planning, and design to look at current events, I guess. Uh, economic justice in relation to what we're seeing uh, in our everyday news, Black Lives Matter and the refugee crisis. And the point that I want to make is that to look at each crisis or grief, as you want to, as another way to put it, as an opportunity. And, and along with that, climate change, I see these as all climate change as an opportunity to address economic injustice through training and education starting at the level that Beth is working on and the community level and primary school through um, graduate school and through practice to make programs like Section 3 real and functional so that the underprivileged, the poor, the disenfranchised, the black, people of color, dis disabled, can learn all of these newly, these programs that are gonna, that are required as of October to build our homes and buildings that are tight, that have new energy systems, require ventilation, there's all these new requirements. Nobody knows how to do it. Well, very few people know how to do it. So this is an opportunity for um, training for people who need to learn that um, and, and, and benefit economically. And then one other kind of side comment, the water infrastructure in our cities needs to be replaced. So we need a systematic replacement plan. How many steps do you have? That's one sentence. <laughs> thank, thank you, Christine. Uh, you'll be happy to know that I'm not going to reply to all those, <laughs> except to say thank you. Um, who else from the 80s? Some of you are from the 80s and aren't raising your hands. <laughs> not, to, not to continue to. to to criticize Chris, but please only write on one side of the paper. <laughs> Ask Holly for more paper. I had, yeah, I, I have needed more. To put it on, I needed to put a, a page on in two locations, but it was on the other side, so I had to choose. Yeah. Gary, when, did you finish? What year? Yeah, I'm uh, 70. You're 70s. Did you give us any? Uh, not yet. Not well, yet. Well, I I you're, 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 you're holding out on us. <laughs> so this is, um, so I'm a 75 graduate. Um, this is um, a kind of a continuation of a theme. Um, uh, the whole idea of resiliency, I think, is really important. And the ability to um, adjust in an equitable manner to, you know, major physical, which would be 
climate change kind of issues, economic and social changes. Fantastic. It's really interesting how climate justice as a pairing starts to take us to a whole new place with regard to many of the things we've already talked about. It's not like it's about the technology of how we adjust to climate or resilience. It's about how we put it in a framework of justice in relationship to the forces that are going to affect quality of life on the planet. And so it, it gives us a way to, to walk and chew gum at the same time with regard to the moral imperatives of what we face that are also related to some of the really serious technical questions about how to, how to build in this new world. Um, this would be a good time to hear from some faculty. Anybody want to offer something up? Ed? I certainly agree that climate change is one of the key issues of our, uh, of our current you know, concerns in our future. But we also have to think more about the impact of diversity and population growth. And I think they're kind of somewhat related. I think our, our world has a huge problem with that. And it's interesting in the 60s, was it the 60s or early 70s, there was, was a huge concern about population growth. And that sort of has died off, died off. Nobody talks about it anymore. And uh, and I think I think we, that's, that's gonna drive shortages, uh, conflict, um, all these things that we'd like to address climate change, but we won't be able to if we're, if we're di diverted by these other issues. Excellent. And the second one is aging. We have, nobody's mentioned aging yet. And the aging of the population is definitely going to drive change in older cities and regions like the ones we lived in. And it's probably going to do it faster than anything else in our, in our context. So Ed and I are of the class of 1960-something <laughs> or 1970-something. Got three here? <laughs> okay, got it. Um, uh, so this, this fits in that frame, and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it. Got it. Um, other faculty who want to come? Good, thank you. Um, so I have I have three, and two of them are sort of related. One is to think of the school as an incubator of um, practices, of potential new collaborations, and this is really something we're already doing. Um, and, and to think about um, how we can start to create uh, more opportunities, especially for our uh, for young architects, um, uh, new faculty, um, young alumni who are really you know, just trying to kind of get started and. and thinking of ways to, to approach professional practice that isn't necessarily just going into offices. So thinking about the school's incubator. And then the other thing is to, is to you know, we all know this, but it's, it's, the, it's a public school and to think about the publicness of the school and how we can uh, encourage and, and work some sort of model to make education even more affordable for our students so that no one is crippled when they, when they graduate. That's terrific. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, that, that whole notion that, um, well, the symposium we did on uh, alternatives to practice that we called alternatives to patronage, that really spoke specifically to the notion that the work that architects do sometimes has agency in and of itself and that they construct a relationship to that agency, they construct the client systems that support it, they actually function that way absent the patronage of the check. They, they do it as an entrepreneurial experience. And the idea that we can experiment is, is I think, where I'm hearing you go, in a kind of an incubator setting for an alternative approach to practice. And this runs the gamut from, some would argue, we could test it here, that the in some ways, the current conventions of professional practice are broken. The financial model it works with is fee-for-service. It's trapped in a kind of a design, maybe a design construct even, but it's still fee-for-service. That doesn't generate wealth. Wealth in today's economy is generated by finance and operation. So if you start to think about that whole system as something that drives the way we design, you still have another alternative to practice. Not, I think, where you were going, but you get a sense of, of um, we can wait for a client to come and ask us 
or we can grow a client constituency that asks the right questions uh, like um, the resiliency, like the movement and transportation, access to services, like the justice issues. And we can do that in micro ways as incubators and we can grow it up from there. So that the range of opportunities for our graduates get way outside the box of conventional practice, even while never denying that's one avenue that we can take. So it's, it's creating more choices. Thank you, Joyce, very much. Okay. Yeah. So just to build on that, actually, um, I think uh, something that uh, it took the university, universities perhaps, to come to terms with the importance of design thinking decades. And now they're, they're showing this increased interest in the idea of design thinking and they want to learn what are the sort of what is working here pedagogically that could be taken up. The, the, what I want to raise there is though, uh, there's almost this kind of increased pressure to uh, kind of uh, think of design thinking as, uh, as a way to sort of almost uh, find quick solutions to problems. Uh, something that I think uh, that's important for the school is to perhaps uh, you know uh, how uh, just let's take the you know the Rainer Benham you know concrete Atlantis did not it wasn't it wasn't a preservation document but it it was a, it was a strong work uh, that actually single handedly uh, garnered interest in you know what was happening there what was unique and then that actually kind of led to this sort of movement to come about so I sort of think I'm thinking of the school and kind of following Joyce's idea, you know, this kind of incubation idea. You know, how how can the school kind of uh, build this sort of a uh, construct a conceptual framework uh, for a Buffalo school, not in the sort of school as in Frankfurt School, as in you know sort of uh, Texas Rangers. You know, the sort of the what are those kind of the unique approaches that are happening, that are present and emerging in the school, and how can that actually be? kind of uh, curated to become uh, the kind of the powerful entity that is, uh, that, that we are aware of, but may not be so visible. And I actually think that there's some latent potential there um, that we could actually mine and sort of uh, use to the city's every, uh, sort of uh, to, to the city's benefit, um, if you do it carefully. <laughs> you got that all on one sheet? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the headline is, Big problems. <laughs> Poverty, sustainability, just city. Got it. <laughs> Other faculty want to play? You know what I'm going to say. I can hardly wait. <laughs> <laughs> so on a local level, establish the Grand Elevator District as a hub unique only to Buffalo. Notice I'm no longer asking you to buy one for our school. <laughs> uh, at the global level, uh, social justice through design research and innovation. And in general, bring delight through design. Yes. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Beth. But applause is good. Don't, 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 don't pretend it. Other people in the 80s that we haven't talked to yet. Let's go to some of our students, and I'm going to come back around to the 90s class. She's been, she's been, she's been waving at me for now. I just, uh, this is not for us, it's more of like a larger school problem, I would say. Uh, and giving low-income students the resources to complete their design education. So uh, sometimes architecture school can be very expensive, and because of that, it is kind of exclusive. Uh, and one of the ways that we can diversify the profession is by allowing diverse populations the, to have support to complete their education. And um, yeah, that's what it was. Thank you. Would you get the mic and bring the tank up? So that whole issue of, of at one level, we listen to all this stuff, we go to plan, and we say, what kind of resources does it take to work on what kind of op idea? and diversity and the cost of education is one of the places we have been over the last several years putting an increased amount of our operating money into supporting. We've seen some positive move in our numbers, um, quite significant relative to the rest of the university and certainly in relationship to the, the diversity that participates in our profession. That's both gender and race and particularly African American. But it's still insufficient. Clearly, we have some structural things to do as well. 
and then I put it in the context of money there is not money somewhere else, and <coughs> what's the trade-off? But giving that increased emphasis is a clear and, and present idea. Um, is there another student wants in? I think we're ready to go here. Um, so I put down sustainable community design build projects for the city of Buffalo. Um, I had the pleasure to get a tour from Ed Steinfeld of the Inclusive Design uh, Rebuild with Habitat. And I think that to further that, and I think we have more manpower in the undergraduates um, that are willing to help and would love to be involved in that as well. So now you're in the spanning between the, the 70s and the current student base with, I want to make things. <laughs> you know, I want to manifest them in, in the world. I, I think, you know, the question here is we're in a school of architecture. And planning. And planning. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I have degrees in both, but I haven't heard a lot of talk, which I kind of stimulated, and I'm assuming it's in all of this design thinking. And if you're not thinking about this in the, in the format of design, I, it, you know, School of Architecture should be thinking about the design of these things. So I think it's very important, at least from my perspective it is, is that when I say any of these things, it goes back to the built environment too. So it's, what is the School of Architecture versus what is the School of Planning? And a lot of this sounds more like from a planning perspective, which is fine with me, but what is the design thinking? Has anybody really talked about it here so far? And I haven't heard that. So. It, it's an interesting thing, especially given where you were in the panel yesterday. So well, I, I've yeah. always been in that format. I no, no, no I, I understand that. But so you dropped that in, and then some of the pushback came from a kind of clear statement about design and material conditions and how that works. And I think that the, the relationship between those two is something that you assume, and that I think we still feel is maybe weak in in terms of its full expression, perhaps here and we should get much better at it. I think that's part of the message that both of you are offering us. Let's, let's, let's be real with the material conditions and the, the making and design of things and understand that is a way of knowing, which goes to the, I think that's a euphemism for design thinking. Well, yeah, I just want to make one brief comment. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Oh, no, no, I, I just oh. want to, I think your, your presentation this morning was, uh, was a really, Good example of of where planning and architecture, the 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 deep understanding of the social and economic and political context of uh, the institutional context of, of a, a design project um, makes the design process way smarter. All, all I'm trying to do, and as I say this, is don't forget. Get, this is, a, is architecture and planning, and yeah. you should keep that in the back of your mind. I'm yeah. not pushing one too hard. Okay. Really, um, there's only about half of them left out there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, 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 did, we have this very young new graduate. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I have to leave a little early today, so I'm having lunch with Dean Cohen. Um, and I wanted to contribute a little bit. I, I don't want to suggest that you should have a trade school attitude, but you are training people to go out there and they need jobs. Um, and I can't speak for architecture, I do know Florida. And I suggest that uh, you develop your alumni connections, um, track where your graduates are located in the world. This is a big world. Buffalo is gonna continue to be an exporter of talent. There's no way that this region can absorb all the architects and planners you're gonna be turning out over the next couple of years. And they're gonna have to go out into the world uh, I don't know the world, I know Florida. Um, it's a pretty big world. I mean, the expectations of Florida will be that it'll double its population in the next 30 years. It's gonna go from 16 million to 30 million. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the leading ed edge of the baby boom. There's another, there's 20 years of people like me and they will be moving south. That's, that is the expectation. Florida is planning, they are planning hundreds of thousands of acres uh, with 50 year plans for development. Uh, they're, that's what's happening down there. Um, there, are, there are jobs that will be involved in all that. Um, I would be realistic about where your planners are needed. I mean, Buffalo is probably not the area where you're gonna do a lot of planners. Um, and have a global perspective. I mean, my, Florida, South Florida is one of the largest Latin American cities. I mean, basically. 
and, and it's tied it's tied economically and culturally to South America and Central America. And there's enormous amounts of back and forth, and you know the development of multicultural. I mean, if you can speak Spanish, I wish I'd taken it in high school and uh, in college. Uh, that would it's a tremendous advantage in in an area of of the country that is one of the more dynamic areas. Uh, you, you can talk about how vulgar it is and all that stuff, but that's where people are moving. That's where they will need people who are going to have your education. So I, in the development of alumni relations, uh, you know, where are your folks? I, 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 you may have that information. I don't know, but I think that's the sort of thing. I mean, I, I wouldn't, ha I wouldn't have moved to been able. Well, I would have moved because I had to. But uh, the reason I'm in Florida is because of the historic connection between Palm Beach and Buffalo. Uh, it's recognized. At, at one point, the uh, in, in Palm Beach County, which has grown in, in my tenure there from 700,000 to 1.4 million, um, the planner who uh, the, I was hired by these are all Buffalo planners. The executive director of the Department of Planning and Zoning Building was from Buffalo. The school. The, the uh, school board of Palm Beach County and Florida County by school districts was from, from Buffalo. The planner who was from the city of Boca Raton was from Buffalo. The planner for the town of Palm Beach was from Buffalo. Buffalo, Buffalo, Buffalo. It was a big connection culturally. Those 200,000 people that left here went someplace and there may be something you could discover where you could track that would be useful to you. Thank you. This imagination that um, they did such a good job here, they went for it if it all even along. But that, no, it's terrific. Thank you very much. Give our best to Harold and Mochizio Crosses for you. Yeah, great. Excellent. Nick. So I think one of the things as we reflect back on what's happened in the past is how we keep Buffalo weird. How we keep it weird. How we keep it weird. So there's a phrase in Austin, Texas that says, keep Austin weird. And so as you become a successful city, how do you keep some of the things engaged um, and what have made it an attractive place for folks into the future? So a lot of these grand experiments that were shared this morning, you know, how do we keep the flexibility in the school and keep engaging those new ideas? So. Um, it's more of a, a thought on that, um, and then so the, let's let's pull out of that then the the, the, the behavioral manifestation that would, would represent part of part of being weird is not knowing what that means. <laughs> and, and sort of like because if you already knew it, then it would probably be something you would normalize over time. But you're actually looking for some form of experimentation or some form of the kind of resistance that Eberhard represented in the early days about, um, you know, architecture is obsolete and that's weird for a school of architecture to profess, but it pushed some things. Is that where you're going with this? It's definitely where I'm going. And I, you know, I think as we move into the future, you know, thinking about what our role is in research, if we try to push and, and compete with some of the other schools like engineering, we lose in a lot of ways there, but if we define what the metrics are and what makes us unique and really make sure we're bringing something to that table, then we have an even expanded role you know, into the future. That's terrific. So the whole university has this cross-cut um, kind of attitude about adding value. Together we can do things we can't do by ourselves. And there's a, an open question about whether architecture and planning gets subordinated in that conversation or with design thinking takes a lead in that conversation. And I, I think that's going to be a tension we're going to experience as we go forward uh, because we see a track to serious money and support in some of the research and ventures, but it takes the PhD taking us into those funding agencies, whether it's NIH or NSF or the EPA looking for that PhD credential that you have, but as a force, it's not part of our intellectual tradition in architecture, more so in planning, but even there, it's a social science perspective that doesn't get the same respect in those tracks. Chasing the money could cause us to lose our identity. So finding ways to, to take advantage of those cross-disciplinary connections without getting eaten by them is a really cute thing. And if that's what you mean by weird, I'm way in. <laughs> so that, that's great. Corey, you want to take a shot? Thank you. In the spirit of weird, I'm going to give you four points. Four. <laughs> 
all on actually, one sheet? They're, they're, they're all on one sheet, oh. and it's actually an extra small post -down. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that design thinking allows us to do is to put together rather unexpected ideas, find rather hidden concepts that when assembled have much greater power than they would by themselves. So a couple of the things that have been said today and yesterday, one conversation around equity, another conversation around innovation, those are two of the points. To that, I would add the conversation of beauty and aesthetics. And the fourth, muck, from Michaela's uh, conversation yesterday, muck, M-U-C-K. Um, because one of, the, one of the things that I take away from that conversation is certainly the hard work and tenacity that it takes to be in a place like this, and the hard work and tenacity that I certainly see on a daily basis from faculty, staff, students, and, and now certainly alumni. Um, but one of the things that was challenging in one of the conversations yesterday where many of the research centers were represented, there was a conversation about how do we better leverage across the research centers, not just within those particular silos. And one of the things that was a challenge of that conversation was there, what opened up was a dialogue or debate between uh, an aesthetic mindset and a social justice mindset, as if those two have a binary opposition to one another and have to fight over turf, mm -hmm. when in fact you need both to recognize whether or not you've achieved either one. So adding to the question of equity, the issue of innovation, aesthetics, and muck. Thank you very much. Do, do we, I, do, I think you picked it up. Yeah, muck, beauty, equity, innovation. Thank you, Corey and Michaela. We have some 1990s decade graduates. There he is. I knew we were going to get you in this mix, Alex. <laughs> Biting your tongue. Oh, my God. So uh, I wanted to uh, emphasize the issue of alumni networking, connectivity, and capacity. Um, the thing that I'm impressed by coming back here, I've, I've been coming back periodically over the last few years, of course. I've been energized by the, by the dialogue, and I've been refreshed by returning after 20 some odd years to the school to see how things have grown, and, and you know, just the community has expanded and, and, and expanded its reach. But I think there's a, there's a further expansion. If you really want to scale this up and, and address these issues on the wall, there's an alumni base that are um, in diverse fields, probably not just architecture and planning specifically, but all kinds of things. And we have resources at our disposal. We have experiences we can bring. We have um, capacity we can offer. And um, yeah, I'm impressed by the people that I've run into, who I you know, went to school with and, and learned from. And, uh, but I'm also surprised by all the people that aren't here. And I really think that there needs to be a larger expansion of this community where more than just the students and faculty here now, we're also the thousands of belongs who have gone out in the world and done things. And I think we need to continue to reach out and, and welcome them back in. We look forward to your help in doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's terrific. How about you guys? You got stuff for us? Sure. I mean, it's a comment that builds up on um, on things that many people have said, and it was kind of spurred on by Erkin's presentation this morning. Um, we were just chatting about it in the hall before, but how do we further um, take out the strategies and the designs that we come up with in the school, and how do we take them out into the community in a more tangible way? How do we make these interventions at various scales um, more visible? So we welcome the community in, but we also make more effort to reach out. Um, and I know it's happening at various scales, but we need to do more. Thank you, Julie. Pass it to your neighbor. I think this has come up uh, a number of times already. I just, I just wrote down social justice 
what is the role or the responsibility or maybe even the opportunity for um, the, the School of Architecture and Planning. I have noticed over the evolution of this that my, my note design here is kind of leaning way to the left. <laughs> <laughs> You're commenting on the politics of your display? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Everything our, our current presidential candidate is nervous about. Yes. <laughs> leaning to the left. Got it. Um, so I wasn't, I didn't graduate in the 90s. Yeah, I got it. You're um, free. It's okay. But there has been some, some talk about design uh, thinking, and I just wanted to maybe shift the gears a little bit to design experimentation and, and material experimentation. Um, and I hope Omar will follow up on this afterward. But uh, So I wrote down precision and materiality, um, and I just want to speak to precision first. Uh, the school actually is, uh, the architecture department in particular, I think, um, well, not in particular, but at least what I'm going to be able to speak to is uh, doing a lot of work in the community, and, and that's manifests itself in a couple of different ways. Uh, one in um, constructing things, right, very large scale uh, design experiments, and in the other uh, way of constructing relationships, which I think is more important uh, for the longer term. Um, and that has a lot to do with the local materiality and the expertise there. Uh, and again, I want to give uh, Omar a lot of credit for spearheading the, I think, the, uh, the current uh, scenario that we now have, which is that it's become very easy for us to get on the shop floor with these material manufacturers and um, not only create cool things, but really uh, develop a new knowledge. Right? So I think there's a knowledge production that's happening, not only on the scale of the workflow of these, in of the, uh, of these industries, because we have a lot of alum, uh, a lot of graduates who are now working for these companies, um, and bringing a lot of you know, new technology, new ideas to those manufacturing processes. Um, but also, uh, you know, through that I think there's a knowledge production of the material itself. And I think through experimentation at a very large scale, which is what these uh, relationships afford us, is very, very unique to this school and uh, something that we really need to continue working on and making sure that our relationships are very, very precisely managed. Um, so it has a lot to do with craft scale and experimentation that I think is uh, uh, maybe things that we take sort of for granted. Um, but I do think that working at the scale that we are, not only at the level of the idea and the workflow, but really at the scale also of the large scale test, uh, is something that we're doing a lot of. And unfortunately, it wasn't represented here today, uh, but that would have been, I think, a, a pretty good part of, of these discussions today. But, so precision and materiality at the scale of industry um, is something that I think we can shift gears toward. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. It, it, it impresses me that as you come into the gallery, during our open house, that the curation and approach to exhibition brought us the fabrication of the exhibit system we lived with for some time, an exercise in fairly unique fabrication in ways of thinking about joinery and making something that is that we can be proud of it, with the precision that you would ask for. And then on the other side, uh, about two tons of exhibition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I got more than one question about it. <laughs> but that is just an extraordinary approach to experimentation and materiality that I think is a part of this, this school's uh, lifeblood these days. And it really, I think, goes all the way back four decades to material thinking and design thinking. Uh, and Omar, you have been a champion of this. You might speak to that, or I don't know that that's what's on your list. Well, it, yeah, it, so, so I think, uh, so just picking up, I think we need a new building culture. Uh, I think our, 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 um, our framework for experimentation, that, uh, and, and obviously I'm building off of that uh, at the school, but in the past was very much focused on a very solipsistic uh, relationship between materiality. Uh, and this is where I do think, as, as Corey's maybe talking about, maybe not social justice, but there are, there's the globalization question and how actually materials move through that system and how we must engage the, them. So uh, tied to that, I think a new building culture is significantly important to, to talk about on the planning level, uh, on the level of architecture, on the level of industrial uh, manufacturing, and fundamentally on the question of making. Tied to that, I think, is a question of what is a 21st century school. We have a 21st century building, uh, and for me, they are, uh, it's already up there, uh, what, what it may be. But I think, for me, the question of the, new, um, the world of new technologies 
is uh, on the one hand an opportunity, but uh, a great challenge. And one of my biggest concerns there is uh, the openness of it and how those opportunities are not very quickly um, brought to a close because of the systems that are being put in place. So uh, Buffalo should also remain an open city, uh, social justice, smart systems, freedom, the commons, public has to be part of our think thinking. But I think tied to that is a new building culture uh, that we have to figure out uh, collectively and foster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ed? Because of our um, work in the uh, field of rehabilitation research and, and development, we have come into contact with the whole uh, rigor of the development process. And we like, as architects and, and planners, we think in design terms. But design is really only a part of a larger process of development, which is conceived in, in different ways by the engineering and business communities. And increasingly today, we're looking at development from a, a not from an open systems perspective as well as, as a, you know, a profit-making perspective. And I think, and the different kind of products of development. And I think that this discussion that Omar and, and Nick were, uh, were advancing is really within this bigger framework. And I think we need to know more about it. You know, I think I, uh, we, we are in contact with people who know all about that. And they are, there are some people at the university. And I think it would be good if we, uh, I mean, to put it in a succinct way, I think the school needs to embrace the rigor of development, the D in R&D. We talk about research, but development is another whole process, and research is related. But if you know anything about product development, only one out of 10 products actually makes it to commercialization and, and use, and why is that? We need to learn more about how to, how to get things to actually have an impact. And there are different kinds of impact. We have to decide what we want to shoot for, too. Thank you. I'm struck by a presentation I heard not too long ago from um, one of our colleagues in uh, Australia, where they've designed a school of architecture's curriculum around um, starting with the supply chain of materials and moving all the way through to fabrication and building. He's not happy with that, but at some level, that's, it's the notion that we've done some experimentation in the school with, which is, can you can you do the life cycle of the material you bought and put in the building, and where does it go to trash? He's, he wants to object, so we'll have this opportunity. <laughs> Never say no to a distinguished professor. <laughs> well, that's not quite true. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, hold on, hold on. I'll hold on. I still got the mic. I'll bring it over to you. <laughs> All I'm saying is that there are so many dimensions that we don't normally consider media in architecture that dramatically influence our ability to deliver architecture. And, and I, I mean architecture in all the revel, the, the rev, rev, what's the word I'm looking for? Reverential. I mean spiritual ways that we were trained in as architects. There's a, there's a a passion and a, and, a, and a kind of confidence in, in quality in architecture that all of us kind of carry somewhere in our genes. Uh, it, I think probably from about freshman year on. <laughs> and, and the notion that that's bigger than what we were trained is really what all of us are pushing on. That there's other things that come into the mix that stir and that uh, with a broad conceptualization of design thinking change the way it work. So we can parse out lots of differences about <coughs> the supply chain, who is, or we can we can really talk about how to think about the the full process by which we make our world and how it then impacts the world we've made. And that kind of relationship of destruction and violence, which is a large part of the history of building in this country. Um, the history of inequity and injustice is a large part of the building in this country. Can be media in this design thinking as opposed to an obstacle to design thinking. And that's kind of what I was trying to get to. Sorry. But we, we now know there's a higher rank than distinguished. It's called simply awesome. 
<laughs> Did you get a bad so, like that? Uh, I think it's, it's a, in the development process, the most important thing is there a need? Is there a need? It, it, the materials and fabrication and supply chain, that's all really important, but it all starts with a need. And there, there's two in, in the world, there are too many things that people invent. You know, it's easy to invent things, actually, if you're creative. And the problem is inventing something that someone really wants. <laughs> and that is the problem with the grain elevators. They're there. They're there. We need to sort of like link what's there with a need in order to actually have it happen. The sign on your back says simply awesome. <laughs> 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 Professor Hatta. <laughs> Thanks, Ed, very much. Uh, yes, um, I would like to chime in, uh, you know, to uh, get this conversation. But first of all, you know, this is a terrific day. Um, you know, thank you very much, uh, Nick. You know, you started with the Pecha Kucha. Uh, by the way, that's, uh, by the, you know, Japanese. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you're curious about uh, what it really means, it's a chatterbox. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, somebody uh, can talk a lot uh, without saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful tradition, you know. And, and, uh, Hero, that you know. may have been the meanest thing you ever said in your whole life. That's <laughs> essentially <laughs> a better picture person. So thank you. You know, um, uh, um, I think you know for me, it's important to uh, you know somebody talked about your collaboration. Um, the you know I think we would like to re um, tie with the uh, regulatory framework. Look, Buffalo is in the cups, uh, in the cups of launching a new um, zoning code called the Green Code. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how it really works. You know, first of all, I like to think more regionally. Um, the, you know, looking at what uh, uh, Portland, Oregon did um, two decades ago, you know, by establishing a <clears throat> um, growth boundary system. You know, obviously, uh, in, in New York, we are uh, completely opposite uh, domain. You know, we have a home rule that began, that's, you know, we have a 200 year old tradition. And uh, that uh, obviously uh, makes the, each uh, small village to have own uh, school system, police, you know, fire, everything on its own right. Um, the, <clears throat> by, you know, regulatory system, what they mean that, you know, we like to, uh, I would uh, like to uh, see a regulatory framework tied integral with the design. Mm -hmm. You know, design of our place um, in such a way that, uh, um, you know, um, the, whether it's uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the revitalization of uh, Derek Street, um, the bringing, a, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, say uh, refugees to be welcomed, you know, and to be able to uh, um, start their own life, you know, all this has to do with the uh, regulatory framework. So if we begin to understand, you know, what it does, this obviously goes beyond the, uh, you know, building a code, you know, fire um, exit uh, requirement, and etc. How we can, how the law begin to uh, affect the design, um, and so as to essentially. Um, you know, stop the sprawl. Uh, you know, Bob talked about it. Um, and you know, the cars car needs because we have to drive, right? From point A to point B. And if we have uh, closer relationships between uh, residents, shopping, you know, school, you know, and the laws are kind of connected um, in a very nice way, you know, through good streets, you know, um, complete street uh, system, uh, we may, uh, you know, um, drive less, meaning that, you know, a fewer cars needed. So if we begin to, you know, I think we are a, a traffic uh, straight, you know, school, this, this school, in a way, I, um, the way I came at uh, this was, uh, you know, to, this, for me to discover this interconnectedness that the Buffalo uh, could offer. 
And I think we be in the exper experimental school, right? We can go back to that kind of spirit, you know, to experiment. All these things that, you know, you talked about. And, uh, you know, uh, to uh, begin to uh, um, build, you know, uh, say a very small, small uh, prototype. Uh, starting with the uh, grow house, right? And, uh, um, you know, um, uh, the uh, habitat for humanities, um, and we can begin to do that. Thank you, Hiro. Which one of these should I take off? Ah, uh, both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Whose hand is that? Oh, Kerry. Okay. He's coming. So a lot of what we talked about this weekend um, were our successes, but we have to recognize the problems that these successes create. And so I think downtown is thriving, the housing market is booming, and that creates its own set of problems. And in our projects, in our work, we have to build that in. So we do this, and it's going to have an impact. North Buffalo isn't affordable anymore. Housing is going for $400,000. The west side, not so affordable. We have first ring suburbs that are under stress. So we do these things and it's great success and that creates its own set of problems. And so we have to build in to our education and to our work, what are the ramifications of what we're gonna do five years 10 years, 20 years down the line. And I think we had the opportunity, and I don't think we do enough of it. Um, Erkin's project did in itself. Planners and architects in the school working more cohesively, doing more joint projects that allow for this broad range of impact studies to happen. Thank you. You did good. <laughs> That whole business of unintended consequence, it's, it's extraordinary how comfortable we get when we teach the basics. We run it out there, you get good at it, and then somebody says you didn't think broadly enough about it. And there's no stopping rule in that. It's John Everhart's doorknob theory. I got a perfect doorknob, but the jam doesn't work. I got a perfect jam, but the door doesn't fit. I've got a perfect door jam and knob, but the hinges don't. And before you're done, it's the planet. <laughs> There's no stopping roll. And what you're saying is that we're not drawing the circle big enough. What I have experienced over my lifetime is every time you draw it bigger, it brings new gifts to the struggle rather than a kind of closure or finish or the opportunity for defeat. When Eisenhower decided to fight a theater of war rather than one battle at a time, he moved from transactions that you win lose to a strategy that could win. And I, I, I'm not sure war metaphors are the right ones, but I do think the violence we do, even in the name of doing really good, isn't a subject of our in our consciousness well enough to, to kind of advance it. And I, I think we heard a lot of that yesterday in some of the equity discussions and some of the other things. So thank you, Carrie. That was really helpful. I saw a hand all the way in the back. And folks, this is a time to be thinking if there's something that hasn't been said that should be said about the central focus or a, a priority that the school should embrace, this would be a good time to offer it up. Please. Hi. Um, so I was recently reading a paper where um, Elizabeth Diller was saying architecture is a technology that has yet to discover its agency. Discover what? Its agency. Thank you. And so um, that kind of, you know, thinking within the framework of economical, e e ecological, social, political kind of justice um, is to think about architecture and design as agency versus object and where does the aesthetic of or where, or where does objectivity and aesthetic play a role in the future of design? Or what is the new aesthetic of an agency? And to not become complacent in the design process um, or the generation of what pro the process outputs. Um, so it's not an answer to something, but it's continually questioning things and educating. 
And I think this is a difference between revolution and evolution, and we need to think along the lines of revolution. Wonderful. Thank you. Very clear. Anything that anyone else would like to offer that we haven't gotten in yet, please, right here in the, in the end, and in, he was interested. Um, something that the school, I think, has been successful with over its history has been cre uh, kind of creating these innovative proposals and solutions to a lot of like local issues and actually implementing them, um, whether they be like architectural or like planning oriented. And I think it would be beneficial for the school to start sort of expanding its scope and sort of start to offer these solutions at a larger scale. Um, and I, I, that could just, you know, we, this area we've been in had so many issues, as, as you had mentioned, like when you first came here, and we've, we're, we're sort of uh, in a good place with that locally, and we can, of course, do more, but I think we can start looking out more and say, we have this... A good method of problem solving in a variety of ways, and so now we can offer our skills to these other scales, whether that be state or national or uh, you know international. Thank you very much. I, I was enormously proud to read in um, Architect magazine uh, two months ago, I guess it was, a piece on on teaching architecture in Rust Belt cities. I, I don't love the title for all kinds of reasons, but there it is. It's Detroit, it's Cleveland, uh, where Kent State has a design center, and it's Buffalo. They told the story, they didn't try and canvas everything in legacy cities, there's about 60 such cities like Buffalo. But there was that point in time in the course of that article where they started to look at the full scale of our engagement and say perhaps better than any other school in America, this school engages this challenge of, of the Rust Belt City and is advancing it. Um, they were also clear in the text of the article that we were local global. So our global health equities and some of these other things were at least alluded to, if not talked about. But the article was specifically looking at whether or not being in a Rust Belt city affects how you teach. My answer is, of course, but we are local global, and how to, how to emphasize that is a big part of it. So that also gets to this idea of bigger frame. Forgive me for the long soliloquy, but at some level, um, I'm, I'm always being impressed with the range we've just talked about, from the most um, deep affection to the detail in making and, and thinking about making and the material experimentation and the opportunities for that and how that can reframe the way you think about very large scale interactions. Um, a robot that delivers just in time ceramic pieces to the job site changes the way you think about possibilities in elevation construction. And suddenly the skin is, uh, uh, is different and dramatically potentially more performative in terms of all manner of things. Those, that's a, that's a sort of from the detail to the big scale. And uh, finding ways to continue to work across those scales is what I think they teach us in the very beginning years of our field. That's what we think about in it as the students are working here, always doing this and thinking that and reinforcing that is what you're really encouraging, it, I think. Are there other folks with new things or new materials? There's somebody um, with a microphone in the back. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I apologize. No Thanks. problem. Laverne Peaks, uh, MEP class of 2008. In addition to what's been said already, I've been thinking about disaster recovery planning. Um, either man-made or natural, and the way you, you sort of plan, replan for community, the resiliency, the, the design aspect, um, but even health, health and, and, and equity as you rebuild, and I think that would be... Hold the mic just a little closer. Yeah, so uh, disaster recovery planning for communities, either natural or man-made disasters, I think this would be important for planners to kind of know <coughs> you know, how to help communities when these kind of things happen. Perfect. Thank you. And in a timely way, I was just handed this poster <laughs> from Sandy to Snowember. <laughs> Climate change and buildings in New York State. Um, I think very much to the point of a passion of our colleague Nick Rakjevic. The conference is November 4th here. 
Um, and you can register at resilientbuildings.org slash symposium. Thank you very much. Amy? Again, yes, thank you. Uh, so maybe a couple um, comments or proposals. One is uh, more normal, one might be more weird. Um, but okay. <laughs> so I think, normal uh, and weird. Got it. <laughs> uh, interdisciplinary is that within the de department itself. Um, I think I was talking to Nick earlier last night about how he wants to put together these sensors and on top of rooftops and I was like immediately thought of Mark and Omar. But I think like in the past I think the research group have research groups have separated themselves in some ways, but in actuality like everyone works on similar problems like uh, what Omar was talking about in terms of sustainability, um, that it's not just about ecological practices, but also about uh, material culture and uh, technology. Okay, and the second one, uh, coming back to climate change, uh, within like, I don't know, in 2120 or whatever, uh, when this world has uh, come to an end, <laughs> and, uh, and we are on spaceships with Elon Musk at the helm, <laughs> taking us to other worlds. Um, I think that would be a way, we laugh sort of, but uh, back to Perkins point, with, in terms of um, relocation, maybe, to take, take a step back, not only with refugees, but for example, in terms of uh, Sandy, Staten Island is now rebuilding the same housing in the same locations. And so it's kind of, I think you can still take those thoughts about how to rebuild or how to move when, or relocate when it's going to happen in some, at some point, and to plan for that as opposed to always rebuilding the same locations. Um, and a lot of the issues will be there as well. Thank you very much. Anything else you need to get? You've got stickers for me. We handed out too much paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come full circle back to architecture, and this is to uh, revisit an issue that had been around forever, but I haven't heard anything new come out in the past 30 years, and that's to create new cultural models of housing. There's all kinds of opportunities, and it may be retrofit, it may be new, it may be ways to deal with group housing, it may be small-scale homes, it may be urban, it may be uh, suburban, it certainly needs to be affordable, and it cer certainly needs to be green and sustainable. That's terrific. Yeah. I think about things like what we call the rural studio that has for years been producing $20,000 homes um, in much more benign clients, <laughs> climates. Uh, and um, I ask ourselves, if we were to give ourselves a challenge, uh, would there be a price point and a technology and a marriage between the two that would give us uh, increased affordable housing capacity in, in our community? That's both a real detailed piece and looking at the scale of work that you're doing with regard to refugee settlements, it's a whole nother dimension of capacity that then plays into some of the work that our global health equities groups are doing in refugee resettlements in places like Uganda. So just run the scale on what's the technology, what's the, what's the recognition of the new social construction of the family or not the family, the change in demographics that we're seeing in, in, in what used to be housing and how many fewer children there are per household and so forth. It changes everything. Certainly, you don't need a dining room anymore. We do not do that. <laughs> well, not in my house. <laughs> Where are you going to fold the laundry? Yes. <laughs> yes, Chris, here, take the mic. I just had some thoughts on, um, in kind of in reaction to the weird and um, then back to the normal. And um, 
kind of relates back to my thesis, which is another whole primer. Um, just wanted to br bring up the whole idea of beauty and of culture and different means of expressing beauty and culture and just uh, historic preservation is one small example, one large example and small example, and innovation and expression. And that there are just so many different ways to manifest beauty and culture. And the, the reason I think it's so important is for me, because every day I walk by the, on my way to work, a streetscape that is full of trash. And combating the negativity with beauty and culture, I think we just have to like take over. That's the one. <laughs> um, so I'm going to touch on the comment uh, that was previously brought up about this idea of like collaboration. Um, but it seems that we keep talking about it from a department point of view. So say GRGs, for instance. Um, but at the rate that we're expanding as a university as a whole, I feel like we don't take advantage of that opportunity uh, to the extent of interdisciplinary work. So the idea of having a hub um, where we can engage, even from a student standpoint or faculty standpoint, uh, with the bigger environment. So various departments, such as engineering or social sciences, um, a place where, or even like a program that's set up where there's an opportunity to come together and share ideas and get other people involved in certain projects. So I think that extent of the idea that, let's say, situated technologies versus ecological practices should be connected, but even on a grander scale, could be connected to various other departments. Um, so how we can bring the university scale back to our programs, because um, we kind of have confined ourselves and it seems a territorial um, kind of building, as well as other departments have, um, and how they kind of stick to their own kind of beliefs and practices uh, but there's not much of a collaboration between all these departments that we have to our, I guess, extent or advantage uh, that are kind of, uh, I guess, living on campus and thriving on our campus, but as individuals and not as a team. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Let me just make a comment as these things are moving forward. Um, the, the university's commitment to what you just outlined is, is is really interesting with some of the problematics that I offered earlier. But a couple of threads I'm hearing is, is like we have made in architecture the graduate research groups a part of our core pedagogy. So we teach through them a kind of attitude about research and I think design thinking as part of that whole construction. But one of the threads is that we're not connecting the dots across our graduate research groups. The intra-engagement mm -hmm. feels like an opportunity we could take better advantage of. That's one of your points. Am I with you there? The other thing that we haven't explored in any depth, but we will this semester or early next semester be inviting into the school a brand new program in the College of Arts and Sciences. It has this amazingly interesting name. We had a chairman of this department who answers to both the Dean of Engineering and the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. If I have my way, he'll sooner or later answer to me too. But we're not there yet, we're not there yet. But, but you can, here's the name of that thing. It's Materials, Design, and Innovation. And they're looking at the chemistry level of material all the way to and through the design of the stuff. And the stuff expands in as you get more innovative. So I, I, I'm just struck by the possibilities that exist. And again, in the world of limited, unlimited resources, every one of the ideas we've just talked about are out there. Let's go get them. <laughs> but, but which ones, when, and how far do we go is interesting. It's particularly interesting to me that if we're not able to string it together in an intra-department or school level, how can we imagine we're going to play in an even bigger level? And when do we lose ourselves in the bigness of it? So I just keep wrestling back and forth with all of that. We should realize that we're already doing that. that you know, and the students agree. may not yeah. be aware of it, or okay. the graduates aware of it, but we have at least five um, cross-school interdisciplinary activities. We have the 
the SMART program, the, the, uh, the 3E program with engineering, uh, public health, and, and architecture and planning. There, there are actually two of those. Mm -hmm. And then we have, uh, and then there's another 3E program with, which is just sort of like they're winding up, but they really started a lot of interesting things with engineering, architecture, and, uh, the other, and uh, nursing, and uh, public health. So we actually have a lot going on, yes. and uh, and I, I I would only see that improve, you know, increasing. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to add. Thank you. Uh, based on the comment, I'm a, I'm not an architect. I'm a chemist here at UB, and so this this idea of being able to integrate and have some cross disciplinary talk, I think, is extremely important at at UB. But moreover is that we're now, UB is three campuses, and we're going to only expand. And so I think the School of Architecture and Planning has to be like central in this idea of how UB is going to expand. What's the design going to be, and how do we get the three campuses more integrated together? Because I think it's one of the things we feel at North Campus I'm, I'm sure you feel it here at South Campus and, and the people downtown is that we all have our little islands of UB and we do occasionally contact each other but but it's not often enough. From your mouth to God's ear, thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever she may be. Yeah. Go. Um, I'm also not an architect, I'm a civil engineer, but the only reason that I'm here and know about this is because I started in architecture, and I feel like that's a bit of a problem that we don't have that much of a intermingling of different departments, considering in the field, architects and engineers rely heavily on each other, and as well as other all sorts of engineering and other disciplines, the arts, everything. So I think it would be beneficial to the students if there was more of maybe even a class where there was a tandem design project or something along that lines. Um, but it would be beneficial for full field training and for ideas and learning to work together with other professions. Terrific. Again, multiple opportunities exist already. We can do better and more. Chris, are you going to go again? <laughs> you have the floor. No, go. You got it. <laughs> it's all right. I'm sorry. I can say that there's hope. I'm in the real world, and um, the where I work, there's interface between so many different aspects: uh, legal, underwriting, architects, government, private development. You know. It's, it's all integrated where I am now, but I'm, I don't work in an architectural practice. <laughs> um, I've been there as well. So um, there's hope. There is one program that I'm aware of that um, is related to, um, it's a different topic, switching topics, related to um, getting, uh, helping college students get through uh, the system when they're from either minority status or economically disadvantaged. It's called C-STEP, and the, um, so that's just the program that's out there. And I actually was a TA for that program when I was here, the summer program. And um, there's a lot of programs out there for integrating um, housing um, and some opportunities with regards to that that are happening now are land banks, zombie properties, historic tax credits, middle income programs which are incentivizing affordable, uh, that are incentivizing middle income and uh, market rate housing in areas of economic disparity and the integration of, um, so those are just some ways out that, uh, that are integrating uh, economic classes within the, the cities. Thank you, Christine. All right, last one. Okay. Um, this is a, uh, a generalization of sitting here and listening to what everybody is saying. Thank you. Um, and um, and it goes back to what this gentleman said a while ago about design. I'm hearing an awful lot about problem solving, and yes, problem solving is very important with all the issues we're facing. But I just want to say that. Um, there needs to be a, the real relevance of architecture. 
there's a lot of bad building out there. There's a lot of builders who are doing architecture. I see it all the time and it leads to boring track houses. So to all you new students, I'm class of 76. I just want to say, don't forget the design part of what you're doing. Um, make your buildings exciting. Be the next Frank Lloyd Wright or Frank Geary and keep that in mind. Um, I also wanted to stress to use, you're talking about new materials, there's some really exciting old materials that are being used. Uh, I see it all the time and I just wanted to bring that up. Um, barn wood, old fences are being used. There's a company out of Waco, Texas called Heritage Barns which takes apart old barns and doesn't recreate them historically, but takes the old timber and turns them into modern homes. And it's really exciting. I'm actually thinking of purchasing one. Um, but there's a lot of old material you probably have in Buffalo to be reused, and but use the modern technology with it. Mm -hmm. So that's all I want to say, because I'm hearing almost it's, it's getting to be one problem after another. Mm -hmm. But be exciting with your design. And I want to, I want to see that come out of the school. Yes. It's really a great final comment. I think that sort of like hang on to the foundation of what we do professionally and otherwise, and certainly design is, is at the core of that. And some of that barn wood's on our floor downstairs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I have a, a slight a, a housekeeping announcement before you do the formal post. You have to take oh, all the okay. paper with you. <laughs> Please take a boxed lunch. <laughs> we have many left over for yourself, for your friends and family, for dinner. Uh, I, I, guess they're, I guess they're out, yes, out, of the, yes. out in the corridor here. Oh, and also, if, you, if you've got a, a, a note that you haven't gotten up here, I'll hang around and try and, and uh, find a place for them in this uh, galaxy of ideas. <laughs> that was my closing. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, you probably didn't know we were going to make you work this hard this morning. <laughs> but it's been extraordinarily helpful to explore the range of ideas, to, to look at the distances between them, and frankly, not so hard to imagine how to draw the connection between the dots. Bradshaw will give us an artful attempt at that at some point in, in I hope for, hopefully the not too distant future and share back with you what we've learned today. But I do take heart in how much commonality there is when, um, when you can string together the ideas we've heard today and understand them as a kind of aspiration for a school of architecture and planning going forward. So thank you for that. You've sharpened our focus. We have a, a slightly better idea of who we should be next. <laughs> and, um, and it will be a much broader conversation among the people who actually have to deliver it, the faculty and students in our programs going forward. Thank you very, very much. And thanks to the Petrochuka family that, that sort of uh, catalyzed this conversation and got us into a really good place in the discussion. Thank you for being here.